In America and Britain today, history is becoming a forgotten subject. Learn why our leaders show contempt for history and why our professors ignore it completely. Understand the devastating consequences of this grave error. Next, on The Key of David with Gerald Fleury. Greetings, everyone. There is a fatal danger in not teaching history. Now, if you look at this uh, dual danger, as I'll show you today, it, it means it's actually doubly lethal, and the American and British peoples are very much afflicted by this crisis. And that's not that hard to prove if you think about it. The uh, being dual means that it's just a twice as big a problem, and what makes this problem even more lethal in that duality is the second part of the duality is uh, hidden from the American and British peoples and the Jewish people in the Middle East. And if you look at it closely, you'll find that most of our leaders not only don't be, uh, learn history, they have contempt for it. I mean, just utter contempt. And it wasn't that way just a few years ago. In the London Times, February 6, 2000, Melanie Phillips said that Tony Blair's government, quote, is obsessed with modernity and contemptuous of history and tradition. That certainly does apply to the U.S. as well. How does that happen since we are so much into education today, at least what we call education? But our not teaching history is certainly not true education. But why do people have such contempt for it? There is something behind this that this world does not understand. I mean, after all, why should you have contempt for your own history? Does that make any sense at all? It's a dangerous, dangerous disease. Now, there's evidence all around to support what I'm saying, but I want to read to you just a little bit of uh, a few quotes here to show you what's happening in our education and what they're doing and not doing about teaching history. Now, let me give you a quote from uh, George Will. I'll, I'll just mention before this that uh, to make sure you understand that we have many, many voices that just teach us that history has no value. Notice what George Will says. He said, Lynn Cheney recalled a 1999 survey of college seniors at 55 elite colleges, from Princeton to Stanford, which revealed that only 22 percent knew that the words of government of the people, by the people, for the people, are from the Gettysburg Address. That's a world-famous, inspiring address by Abraham Lincoln. And most of our college students don't even know anything about it. They don't know who gave it and why. And of course, 40 percent of them, it says, don't even understand that the Civil War was in the second half of the 19th century. And that's when President Abraham Lincoln was uh, leading the country. The survey goes on to say, some questions should not be difficult for high school seniors, but at the time of the survey, none of the 55 colleges and universities required a course in American history, and students could graduate from 78 percent of them without taking any history course. 78 percent could just skip over history altogether and totally. Now that is a, I tell you, it's a dangerous flaw in our educational system. And it isn't that hard to prove if we know anything about history. And there's a lot that to be said about history and how it has educated so many of our leaders. But that's a, certainly a deadly crisis. And I want to give you another quote here, this one from uh, 
one of Winston Churchill's greatest biographers, William Manchester. Here's what he had to say. He said that Churchill saved Western civilization, not just Britain and Europe, talking about in World War II, that he saved Western civilization. Now, other historians have made the same statement, and that all happened in World War II not so long ago, and uh, there's been a big change in the way we view history and our teaching of history and not teaching it since World War II. Why is that? What does that reveal about us? And it's something we need to understand. I'm telling you, we really, really do need to understand this. Here's another quote from Henry Steele Cominger, who uh, wrote an introduction to Winston Churchill's biography of his ancestor, Marlborough. I guess this is the first quote I've given from him. But anyhow, Mr. Cominger wrote, Churchill's reading of history reinforced his early education to exalt heroic virtues. In other words, he really goes on to say that the foundation of Churchill's education was history. And here is a man that was said to have saved Western civilization. Don't we need to know about that history? Don't we need to understand that and why and how he saved Western civilization and how it was almost destroyed because people wouldn't listen to him? This is history at its very best, and we need to understand and learn from history. If we don't learn from secular history, there's a much greater danger that's down the road, and it's hidden from most people, but it should not be. And I'm going to show you what it is and what it means. Mr. Cominger also said this, he cherished as a law of history the principle that a people who flout those virtues are doomed to decay and dissolution, and that a people who respect them will prosper and survive. He says, look, if you, if you flout those virtues that we learn from history, that it's, you're, you're doomed to decay and dissolution. That's what Winston Churchill said. The man who's foundational education was history, and for good reason, if you understand. There's so much about history that even prophesies about the future. That's what Churchill learned, and he called it a law of history. So history, in many ways, prophesies the fate of nations, and we've got some material we'll send you to prove that to you. And one of them would be the book on the former prophets, which talks about this law of history. So much uh, history that we need to understand. He goes on to say, our nations came close to losing World War II, or he talked about that until they finally woke up. And then he said, uh, history is just a philosophy teaching by examples. And here's what he said. I'll quote this. First, he says, he has seven points here, I'll just quickly run through them. First, history it was not just the pursuit of idle hours, but was itself philosophy, teaching by examples, and rightly read, furnished lessons which statesmen could ponder and apply. Second, history was both memory and prophecy. It actually prophesies what's going to happen to you. If you understand the past history, you can learn lessons and see how not to repeat the bad uh, wars and examples and that type of thing. He goes on to say that uh, four times Britain had fought to rescue Europe from the grip of a tyrant, Louis XIV, Napoleon, Kaiser William, and Hitler. Two of those are Germans, and Germany started two world wars, and yet Britain has had a history very different from that. Why is that? Why are these nations so different, and how can you understand that if you don't understand history? I mean, we're talking about world catastrophes. We're talking about uh, just monumental problems. Notice here, he says, fourth, history bore witness to the vital importance of national character, and character was as important to a people as to an individual. And 
every nation must be alert. And yet, if you look at our politics today, when they're running, uh, the two people are running for president, they don't even talk about character today because it doesn't mean anything to people for the most part. And the main reason why is because we don't learn from history. We don't learn history. And that's no small problem. The sixth lesson, he said, is that from all this flows, that sixth lesson, that the test of greatness was politics and war. Battles, he wrote in the Marlboro, are the principal milestones in secular history. All great struggles of history have been won by supreme willpower, resting victory in the teeth of odds. Strong willpower, and that's what we're lacking today in the Western world, in Britain and America and the Jewish nation. We're lacking willpower. We lack the will. And why is that? Did you know that the Bible has a lot to say about that? It really does. But let's look at the seventh lesson. The history of war is, is a part of history. It teaches a seventh lesson, taught it not only to Churchill, but through him the vital importance of leadership. He was a leader and a powerful leader. And he saved Western civilization, many historians will say, or quite a number of them, anyhow. And he had, as another historian said, a historical perspective. He didn't just get wrapped up in the present. He saw the big picture, the past, the present, and the future. And he said the farther you see in the past, the more deeply you can see into the future. It gives you vision, vision to even prophesy, as he was credited with being able to do because of his uh, learning history and being an expert in that history. Let me give you uh, an example here of Mr. Lincoln where it gets into the second part of this dual problem of not teaching history. Notice this part of the problem, and this is the one that's hidden from most people. Here's what Mr. Lincoln said. It is the duty of nations, as well as of men, he wrote, to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God, and to recognize the sublime, the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. He said, go went on to say that we have forgotten God during the Civil War. This statement he made was a sublime truth. In other words, it, uh, it inspires awe, and it's noble, and it's exalted. This president knew that secular and Bible history prove that fact. Yet, but today, many scholars just scoff at history. So we see that the second part of that dual hi uh, history problem, not teaching history, his Bible history is so critical. And here is the problem. If you start out, and this is really critical to understand, if you start out teaching secular history is not important, that's just the first part of the problem. But it leads to a much bigger one. Pretty soon people say, well, neither is Bible history of any value to us. And that's what most scholars say today. And they are vastly mistaken about that. You see, that's what most people do not see. Let me give you one quote here from Abraham Lincoln. Here's what he said. Unless the great God who assisted President Washington shall be with me and aid me, I must fail. But if the same omniscient mind and almighty arm that directed and protected him shall guide and support me, I shall not fail. Let us pray that the God of our fathers may not forsake us now. That is during this civil war. And do you know that we have commentators on TV now that says they really fear that America is going to enter into a civil war? And if we do, it'll be far worse than the other civil war, the first one. Now that is something serious because 
I don't know how anything could be much more devastating to a country. And if you understand Bible prophecy, you know those things are going to occur if we don't make sure that we're not forsaking God. Abraham Lincoln just blatantly said it to the people, said, We have forsaken God. And he just prayed that God would not forsake them. And he didn't. And Abraham Lincoln was the main reason for that, I think, because of his leadership. God did it all, of course, but He did it through a man. He wanted to save America for a greater purpose later on. In Ezekiel 5 and verse 8 it says, I, even I, am against you. So we see that Abraham Lincoln kept the nation united, and it didn't divide. And who knows what kind of a, a conglomerate we would have here if he had not done that. And how blessed we have been to, uh, to have this unity in America. And we wouldn't have been able to win World War II without it. Can we learn from past history? Lincoln said we must or we're in serious trouble. Now, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11, let me read that to you. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So here is the Bible telling us that, look, you better learn from the examples of the past, or you're going to be in serious trouble. And America and Britain and the Jewish nation have a history with God. And let me tell you that Germany and Russia and China and India and those nations don't have a history with God. That is the God of the Bible. And we'd better make a distinction there. Let me just quote a little from an article about an archaeologist who digs according to Bible history and has made the most discoveries, critical and significant discoveries, I think, in this end time for over uh, hundreds of years. My son wrote an article about her defending Elat Mazar and the biblical record uh, that this is, was in the Philadelphia Trumpet, March 14, 2008. And here's what uh, it says in answering scholars who criticize Elat Mazar's discoveries of King David's palace in 2005 and Nehemiah's wall in 2007, Herschel Shanks recently wrote in Biblical Archaeology Review, quote, No one would question her professional competence as an archaeologist. Her chief sin, however, is that she is interested in what archaeology can tell us about the Bible. Well, why should scholars reject that and scorn that? Well, she used an example about uh, in 2 Samuel 5 and verse 8, it was talking about the Jebusite fortress that uh, David and uh, Israel conquered from the Jebusites and made it uh, into the city of Jerusalem. And there was a fortress there. But then in verse 17, I'll just quickly read this to you. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David. And David heard of it and went down to the hold, or went down to the fortress, that Jebusite fortress. She noticed that it, it said David went down to that fortress. So she know, knew it had to be, his palace had to be above it, up above it on a pretty high hill there in Jerusalem. Now, she started digging according to that scripture. And I'll just give you a quote here to illustrate that to you. Near the end of David's palace construction, the Philistines attacked, and since the new palace may not have been reinforced strongly enough to withstand the Philistine assault, verse 17 says David went down to the citadel, or that Jebusite fortress, to barricade himself within the city walls until the conflict ended. 
This Lot Mazar theorized more than ten years ago and indicates that David's new palace stood on higher ground than the Jebusite fortress. This is my son's article that I was talking about. She published her theory in Biblical Archaeology Review in January 1997 under the title, Excavate King David's Palace, on a two-page spread picturing an artist's rendering of the ancient city of David. Mazar drew an arrow pointing to the north of the city underneath the caption, It's, it's there! <laughs> and right in the, the very lead into the article. There was a picture there, and she was talking about this fantastic house that even had walls like five meters thick in places. And yet, the statements she's making about even David's palace, this, this absolutely inspiring, godly discovery, and that can be proved as well, she was met with more hostility from numerous scholars who simply reject the Word of God, reject Bible history. And where has it gotten them? They don't have discoveries like she has. Nehemiah's wall, and David's palace, and Solomon's wall, and two seals from Jeremiah's time that proves the history of Jeremiah, and all kinds of other very important finds, because she's digging according to the narrative in the Hebrew Bible, or what we call the Old Testament. Here's what Shank says, we wrote about anyhow, uh, points out in a recent column, he said this, Dr. Mazar's chief sin is making a reasonable judgment about archaeological evidence as it relates to the Bible. In some scholarly circles, he wrote, this is considered unscholarly. If the judgment she made related to something other than the Bible, no one would give it a second thought. Only a finding related to the Bible brings such castigation and criticism down on the head of the leading archaeologist. Even when proven true, many scholars still reject it. See there again, that's where we begin to go wrong. You reject secular history, and then you reject Bible history, and then you reject God. That's why this, this dual, dual problem of not teaching history is such a lethal crisis, fatal, if we don't learn how to do it the right way. But Dr. Mazar pointed right where David's palace was. She had to wait over eight years to get funded to dig there where she pointed that David's throne was, and then with months when, after she started digging, she found David's palace. And I think that is just absolutely phenomenal. See, we have rejected secular history, we have rejected Bible history, and we have allowed a great dragon, it says, to become the God of this world. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4 and Revelation 12 verses 7 through 9. Satan has deceived the whole world, the whole world, educators, religious leaders, Everybody has been deceived except a little remnant, a little remnant of God's own people who heed God's message. That's really important for you and me and all of us to understand. Until next week, this is Gerald Flurry. Goodbye, friends. Request The Former Prophets, How to Become a King, to grasp essential lessons from the lives of Hannah, David, and other biblical heroes. You will also receive a copy of Defending Elad Mazar and the Biblical Record. All our literature is available free of charge at no cost or obligation to you. Order now.